Uh, it's now 10. Uh, good morning, everyone. Any questions before I finish chapter four? Any questions? Yes, please. Okay, I'll explain it on the next slide. That's a very good question. Any other questions? No questions. So the deadline for your first coursework is 6 p.m. this Friday. No late submissions will be accepted. If you have any issues with the IT, I mean, if you have any IT problems, Send me an email before the submission deadline. If you submit the coursework online, I mean, to me directly, it won't be accepted. And the portal will be available this week. What you could do, you have unlimited attempts. You can just submit a blank paper. That's absolutely fine to see whether you know how to use it. And you get a receipt, a digital receipt. If you don't, again, please let me know. So you have unlimited attempts. So I cannot accept any excuse that I had problems submitting the work. And this is a group submission, very similar to what you did with your laboratory raw data. Any questions in regard to that? OK. So I have almost finished a chapter four. A small section is remaining, and that's when the open sections are subject to When open sections are subject to torsion. So this is what we've covered so far. I started this chapter with analysis of uh, circular sections solid, hollow, or thin wall with uniform sections of the torsion. Then we moved on to analysis of thin walled closed sections, either single cell or multi-cell tubes. For the single cells, these are the equations we used, the relation between the torque applied, the shear flow distribution, and how to find the rate of twist or angle of twist. And the shear flow is defined as the product of the shear stress and the thickness. For the multi-cell tubes, we cannot just use equilibrium to analyze it. Therefore, we have to combine the equilibrium equation and compatibility equation to, for, to solve the problem. So the equation for shear flow is still is applicable. The shear flow is the shear stress multiplied by the thickness. Now, the question you ask is, what's the difference between the cross-sectional area and the area enclosed by the perimeter? So this is a single cell tube. This black area is the cross-sectional area. If you calculate, which is a very small value, that is the cross-sectional area, so the black section. The area enclosed by the perimeter is this hollow section. So this is just the length of these uh, panels when you add them up. Does it, uh, does it answer the question? So the cross-sectional area is the area of the section. So if you've got, say this is a thin wall section, so the area of this thin section is the cross-sectional area. So if I apply an axial load, I have to find the of this area, and the force divided by area gives you the, say, normal stress. But this blank section, this hollow section, is the area enclosed by the perimeter. That's the so this is what we've done, and I did it last week. Now the next part is analysis of open sections as subject to a torque. Now an open section hardly has any strength or stiffness when it comes to torsion. So when you're designing a structure, which is a combination of closed tubes and open tubes, similar to this wing section, and exact, I mean, 
an idealized wing section, is made of two cells and an open section. If it's subject to torsion, the open section in design is usually ignored because it has hardly any stiffness and strength, which I'm going to show you <coughs> theoretically the reason. When it's subject to axial loading, when it's subject to bending, it's shear loading, it's absolutely fine. But when it's subject to torsion, it has hardly any st stiffness or strength. So I haven't taught it for a few years, but I thought perhaps this year I add it to the lecture slides. It's not difficult, the other parts are much harder, but this is quite a straightforward to understand. So I start with a torsion of a thin strip subject to torque. So when you say a thin strip, it means the thickness in comparison with the length of the strip is quite small. So at the moment, you're looking at the cross-section of the strip, very similar to this one, with a very, which is the depth is a normal to the plane of this line. So I have given it in thickness, which is actually very, very thin. So say the thickness is one millimeter and the width is 50 millimeters. So you can see the ratio is quite a small. Now, in order to solve this problem, there are different approaches. You can use the stress function, you can use membrane analogy, or you can use equilibrium. There are different methods for doing it. So in uh, the book by Maxon is done it using membrane theory. In the book, I believe, which I've referred, I mean, one of the reference books is done it using equilibrium. It's uh, solids and structures by Rees. That's done using equilibrium. And I've seen it using stress function as well. Now, the method I'm showing you is just an approximate method, but the equations are exactly the same as if you used any of those approaches which I mentioned. So this is a very straightforward approach to find the same equations. Say so this is, this thin strip is made of a series of, i show you the screen is better, is made of a series of concentric tubes. Similar to question eight, which I solved for you on a Friday. So we assume it's made of a series of concentric tubes which are all stuck together. So if we ignore all those sharp corners, we assume we've got fillets at all those sharp corners. So you can see we've got sharp corners. So imagine we've got fillets in those places. Now if I apply a torque, obviously this all these uh, tubes are going to start rotating with the same angle of twists based on the theory you learned in the previous part of this chapter. So I'm taking one of these tubes, so I said it's made of several concentric tubes which are all stuck together. It's a very, very small thickness. So I'm taking one of those tubes, which is hollow, and I assume this tube is carrying a torque of a DT, a differential of the External torque. So say this edge, top and bottom ones are placed at a distance of y from the x-axis. So I've attached xy coordinate system to the cross section and z is along the axis. So say the thickness of this tube is dy. So this is y, this distance is y, the thickness is dy. The width is equal to b. Now, based on what you learned in the previous part of this chapter, if I've got a single tube, single cell tube, with a uniform thickness, it's subject to a constant shear flow and constant shear stress. So for the tube, this equation is applicable, which I saw an example for you, similar to this one on Friday. So this is made of the same material, so G can be extended extracted from the integral. The thickness is constant. It can also be extracted from the integral. And the loop integral of ds is just the perimeter of the tube. And the ratio between q and t is the shear stress. So the q over t is shear stress. The thickness is constant. So therefore, the shear stress is constant because q is constant. 
and the area is equal to 2b times y, the area enclosed by the perimeter. So I'm going to substitute this value in the top equation. So in that case, we have d theta over dz, loop integral of ds is equal to 2b, 2 times the area enclosed by the perimeter multiplied by gt. Q over t is equal to the shear stress, and area is equal to 2by. So if I substitute the values, I get this equation. So the shear stress is equal to, uh, the rate of twist is equal to the shear stress divided by 2 times the width of the strip, multiplied by the coordinate y, or the distance of this fiber from the x-axis, multiplied by shear modulus. So this is the first equation that we found it. In books, usually they find it using equilibrium method. So this is the first equation. But what does this equation tell us? For a constant value of the torque, the rate of twist is constant. So d theta over dz is constant. So in, it means g is constant as well. So in this thin strip, although it's very thin, based on this uh, theory, the shear stress depends on y. So it means at the top and bottom layers, we have the maximum shear stresses, and at the center, we have zero stress. So this is the profile of the shear stress distribution. So even for a very a small, in this a thin section, based on this equation, we can see the shear stress is maximum at the top and bottom. So we don't have the same assumption we made for closed tube, single cell or multi-cell, that we assume through thickness variation of shear stress is constant. So this is the first relation. Now at the moment, we don't see any sign of torque. Now the next stage is finding a relation between the torque applied and the angle of twist, the torque applied and the shear stress. So here, Based on what you learned in the previous section, this is a single cell tube subject to a torque of dt. The shear flow in this little, a small cell is equal to the torque applied, which is equal to dt divided by its area, enclosed by the perimeter. And what was area equal to is equal to 2by. So I substitute in this relation. On the other hand, I say K, Q is equal to 2. Yes, please. Can you explain how you got the red box again? How do I got the red box? Like the stuff in the red box. OK. Are you happy with what I've written here? Yes. OK. I just multiplied this by the left hand side. And d theta over dz is theta over L. So the four two is equal to two b y g d theta over dz. But the thing is here, I've written it in terms of the shear stress. So this is two g y d theta over dz. That's right, b is missing. Thank you, thank you for that. Okay, okay. So this is the area which is equal to, no, no, B is not missing. B is going to be eliminated with this, uh, with this one. They have a B at the top. So this B shouldn't be here. So this has already been eliminated. So this is. Sorry, but can you tell us where the two B comes from? So this B shouldn't be. What do you mean two B comes from? All right, okay, this is equal to y, this is, this is equal to y, this distance is equal to y, this distance is equal to y, and this distance is equal to y as well. So this area is equal to b times 2y. This is a rectangle with the height of 2y and the width of b. Does it answer the question? Um, does it mean that the 2b is the 2b, 
So this area is this, we are talking about this area. What is uh, the area of a rectangle? The width is equal to B and the height is equal to each one of these edges is at a distance of Y from the X axis. So therefore the area is equal to 2BY. Does that answer the question? Yes? You had the same issue on Friday, didn't you, with area? <laughs> so are you happy with this, 2BY? Okay. Yes? So the loop integral DS is the perimeter. Yes. Because the thickness is very, very small, so we, we ignore it. I tell you, okay, that's, that's a very good question. And the moment, I, so are you happy with the area I've shown here? Okay, so I know what the problem is now. I just clear these. So the thickness is one millimeter, and the width is, say, 50 millimeters. Say the thickness of each of those tubes is 0.1 millimeters. So if I want to fill the section, I have 10 of those. So I, it means lengthwise, I just lose one millimeter on both sides out of 50 millimeters. So because it's very, very thin, we can ignore that. Does it answer the question? So the only problem was here that I had, I had to eliminate it. So this is the only issue. This B doesn't exist here. But this is because we have a B here. And this will be eliminated with this V. So this is the equation for it. Are you happy with the answer? Uh, is everyone happy with the answers I provided? OK. So as I said, I mean, the, this is a fair question. Just remember, I have given it a thickness here. Say each of those tubes has a thickness of 0.1 millimeters. So if I just want to fill this gap, I, have, I use 10 of those tubes. So what, on the length side, I only lose one millimeter on each side. But because the width is much, the thick, I mean, the width is much, much higher than the thickness, it does not affect the solution. So that's why I have made some approximations here. So are you happy with this equation now? Are you happy? The question you asked. Okay. So we move on to the next part. So that is uh, the shear flow in one cell. The torque applied to this one cell is equal to dt, which is the differential of the torque, divided by 2a. a is equal to 2by, therefore q is equal to dt over 4by. Now q, on the other hand, is equal to t times a t, and t is equal to dy. So the thickness of this tube is equal to dy, which is this t in this equation here. Now I'm going to say q is equal to t times a tau or tau times a dy. Now we have now an equation on the left hand side which is just a torque on the right hand side which is just in terms of y. So shear stress for this tube is constant or we can just substitute the value of whatever we found on the top. So I use this equation in the bottom one. I can say the torque is equal to 4 times 2GY d theta over dz or theta over L multiplied by VBI multiplied by dy. Now the y is changing between t over 2 and 0. We cannot say t over 2 and minus t over 2 because this is not an element just on the upper surface of the section. It's at, the, at both sides. Therefore, the thickness changes between 0 and t over 2. Now, the integral of y squared dy is equal to 1 over 3 y cubed. t over l is constant, g is constant, so therefore the answer is equal to t equal to g theta over l multiplied by 1 over 3 bt cubed. Now you can see here the sign of t cubed appears in the previous chapter. We said the high power of t is ignored. And that's the reason I said at the beginning that if we've got a, an open section, it hardly has any stiffness and a strength 
when it comes to a torque. So therefore, if I just rearrange this equation and we compare it with the equation we had for a circular cylinder subject to a torque, we can say here J prime acts very similar to polar second moment of area of the circular cross section. It's not called a polar second moment of area, it's called torsional constant. But you can see it has the same unit. J prime is equal to 1 over 3 Vt cubed. So this is the second equation we found for finding the, an angle of twist, and it's a direct relation between the torque and the angle of twist. And we can combine these equations and we can have a direct relation between the torque applied at the angle of twist or rate of twist and the shear stress as well. So I've written it for you as these three equations have been combined and as written as the equation you see in this square. So you can, if you just want to have a relation between the shear stress and the rate of twist, you use these two. If you want to have a direct relation between the shear strength and the torque applied, you use these two relations, or you can use these two. So this is the equation I've added to your examination data sheets. As I said, I haven't taught this part uh, for a few years, so it is not in the previous year's examination data sheets. But I have set your examination paper, and it's been sent to the external examiner. As soon as it's approved, I will let you have uh, the data sheets that you are going to get during your own exam. And where is the position of the maximum uh, shear stresses is on the top and bottom layers, when y is equal to t over 2. So if I substitute t over 2 in this relation, I can say the maximum shear stress, which is equal to 3t over bt cubed. So there was a mistake here because I had to eliminate a B from both numerator and denominator, but everything is fine and I believe you understood why the thickness. So we ignore the thickness of the... Any questions on this slide? So on this slide we've got a thin, a thin strip which is subject to a torque and we found the angle of twist and we found the shear stress. But based on this relation, as I said earlier, the, stiff, the torsional stiffness of a thin strip subject to torsion is very, very small, so it hardly has any strength and stiffness. Now let's... So I've written the same equations on the next slide. We can use the same relation if we are analyzing an open section with uniform a thickness such as a Z section or a circular section, provided they are open, we still can use this equation, these equations, but B is the total length of the section. So in this case, B is equal, it's like we assume uh, those sections are made up of folding a thin strip at different locations. So we can assume this is the same strip we have on the right, but it's been curved or we have folded it at these two locations. But if I've got a variable thickness, like a, this a channel section, it's open, it's subject to a torque, but the thickness is a variable, it's subject to a torsion. In that case, the torsion constant is defined using this relation, which is called a Sommenon's torsion constant. So as I said, this is not a polar second moment of area, but it does exactly the same job. It has the same unit. So the higher this value is, the lower the angle of twist and shear stress are, and vice versa. So any question on slide number 17? Okay, so let's solve this example. It's a very straightforward example. We just use those equations I showed you earlier. 
It's a thin strip with a thickness of one millimeter and the width of 50 millimeters. No, sorry, two millimeter thick and subject to a torque of 10 newton meters and the strip has a width of 50 millimeters. The problem is asking us uh, to find the maximum shear stress and the angle of twist or rate of twist. And as I said, I prefer these equations because it's quite handy. You can relate the, any of the, those two terms and find whatever you are after. So first we start with the, these are the data I've extracted from the description of the problem. So first I find the torsional stiffness which is equal to 1 over 3 B times a T cubed. B is the width of the strip, which is 50 millimeters, and the thickness is 2 millimeters, so I substitute in this, in this equation. So I'm after the maximum shear stress. The maximum shear stress occurs on the top and bottom layer, when Y is equal to plus or minus 2 over 2. Or I've also added this to your examination data sheets where the maximum shear stress is a 3t divided by bt cubed. So from there you find a maximum shear stress, yes please. Are you sure it's bt cubed because it says here in the presentation that it's bt squared? Oh no, no, no. Because if you use this relation, the maximum shear stress occurs at plus minus 2 over 2. Oh, if you substitute the value of 2 over 2, then you end up with this relation. So it ends up with 3t over bt cubed. Okay? Now I'm going to, so you have this 1 over 2 here. You've got 2 here. They will be eliminated. So this equation gives you the maximum shear stress, which is at the top and bottom layers. Now this is the next relation I'm going to use. So in your examination data sheet, I wrote a theta equal to t times L divided by g times j prime. Instead of j, I used j prime. I didn't want to confuse you during the exam. So j prime is for a thin section, which is open. And in this one, this is a thinner strip. So j prime is equal to 1 over 3 bt cubed. So if I substitute the value, we get an angle of a rate of twist of 0468 radians. So this is quite straightforward. So I repeat, I have included this equation for you when we have a uniform thickness and obviously the maximum shear stress occurs at the top and bottom minutes. So y is equal to t over 2, so you end up with this relation here. Yes, please. G is equal to 80 gigapascals, yes. Yeah, but for the data list on the right of strip, it says 85. Oh, sorry, it's 85, yes, sorry. I don't remember, I believe, you, can you try it yourself to see which one is correct? Okay. I think it's 80 or 85, so I appreciate it. If you try the, one of them and tell me which one is the correct one. I believe 85 is correct because I took it from uh, one of my previous lecture slides. So I, I think this is correct. The description is a. So any, any, any other questions on this slide? Any other questions? So this is a channel section, again, it's subject to a torque, assuming the torque is applied through its shear center. The concept of shear center, I'm going to cover it in the next chapter. So the problem is also asking us to find uh, the maximum shear stress and the rate of twist. So can somebody tell me what B is equal to for this, uh, for this channel section? Assuming the bottom uh, edge is equal to A, and the vertical wall is equal to C. Can somebody tell me what B is equal to? C plus 2A. Very good. So B is equal to C plus 2A. 
So it's the total length. Imagine this is imagine this is a strip which is folded at these two location, two locations. So therefore the B is equal to A to A plus C. So I'm using exactly the same equation. The only difference is I have to use J prime, which is some Venon's um, torsion constants. So here I've got J prime, which is equal to one over three BT cubed. So I just use the, the first, um, this equation, and this one, the first, the last two. And this is the same because the thickness is uniform. So here, B is equal to 2A plus C. And from there, I can find uh, the rate of truth. Any questions in regard to this example? Shouldn't Y be? What do you mean Y should be C? Oh, no, 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 no. This Y, that's a very, very good question. If you look at this strip we analyzed, we attach XY coordinate system to the cross section. And Y, maximum Y was the plus minus two over two. So x, y, at the moment, you don't see x, y on the, I haven't attached x, y coordinate system on this one. But I'm, this y is, if I just draw the strip for you, so this is the strip, so this is t, so this y is the distance from this x-axis. Now um, imagine this channel section is a thin, thin strip which is folded at different locations. That's right, yes. So this is a distance from the center of the shell, the mid shell, this point here. So this is not this y. I haven't, drawn, I haven't shown you any y coordinate here. Does it answer the question? So it's a thin strip. XY coordinate system is attached to the strip. So for the vertical one, it's rotated in the center. So it, as I said, is when you're looking at it, it's like each one of them has got its own XY coordinate system. If it's flat, obviously they're all the same. But when you rotate it, it's a Y is actually attached to the section. Each root will, does it answer the question? That was a good question, actually. Any other questions related to this example? So this is a thin strip. XY coordinate system, I haven't shown you for the whole channel. It's, XY is a local coordinate system of a thin strip which is folded at these two locations. So it's folded at these two locations. So we've got a flat strip and then we folded it. Any other questions? This, this is a very good question. So if it's anything, if it's folded, we can consider like that's what I'm, yes, absolutely, yes. So that's what I'm saying, for open sections, the approximately, we assume is a thin, is a flat panel, it's like a flat panel, which is bent or folded at different locations, or curved at So we move on to the next example. So this is a very good example that we can compare the strength and the stiffness of a closed a section and open section. So that's what, as, I said at the beginning, when you're designing a, a structure, which is a combination of open and closed sections, if it's subject to torque, then you ignore the existence of the open parts. So in this example, we've got a single cell on the left-hand side. On the right-hand side, it's exactly the same as On the right hand side, we have exactly the same cell, but we've got a cut on the side. Imagine the, assume that the height of the cut is very, very small. 
So we are going to compare the strength and the stiffness of these two. We're going to compare the maximum shear stress. If they are both subject to the same torque, we're going to compare the maximum angle of twist or the angle of twist of the two when they are subject to the same torque. Assuming these two are identical, the same, they're made of the same material, everything about them is the same, except this one has a cut and the other one doesn't have it. So everything about them is the same. So this is what we are going to do. We are going to compare the maximum shear stress of the left one with the right one and the maximum, I mean, the angle of twist of the left one with the right one and find the ratio between the two. So for this one, we can use the theory you learned in the for second cylinder subject to talk. You can also or use the theory you learned for the single cell thin wall section subject to a talk. It doesn't make any difference. So here I've used this equation, TR over J. Or you can write it as the equation you had, T is equal to 2AQ, and then we write Q equal to T times a 2. Your choice doesn't make any difference. However, I've made an approximation for value of J. I showed you that in chapter 3, J for a a circular section, which is a thin with a radius of r, is equal to 2 pi r cubed t. So this was an approximate value for finding uh, the second moment of area of this section. So for i was equal to pi r cubed t, j is ix plus i y, so it's equal to 2 pi r cubed t. The section is a thin, so we only have uh, the radius r to include it in the equation. You only have one value that through thickness variation is negligible. So this is uh, the maximum shear stress for a closed uh, thin wall section subject to a torque. Now if we move on to the right hand side. For the right hand side, I'm not allowed to use this equation. We use this relation. It has a uniform thickness and you're allowed to use it 3T over BTQ. Or the other equation I showed you earlier, you can use 2GY, DY, I mean, and then it substitute the value of Y equal to plus minus T over 2. Now, can you think what I am supposed to write for the value of B in this equation? Don't say that now. What is B equal to? Imagine it's a flat panel which is rolled like a cylinder. You say, yes. That's absolutely correct. It's equal to the perimeter of a circle, which is 2 pi r. So in this one, the length of the thinner strip, which is rolled, is equal to the 2 pi r. So b is equal to 2 pi r, t is just t, and I just substitute the values. So we've got 3 times the torque divided by 2 pi r cubed, 2 pi r t cubed. So now we're going to find the ratio between these two. So the maximum shear stress in the open one, everything about them is the same. The only difference between these two is that one is open, the other one closed. So the maximum shear stress in the open section is three times r over t. And obviously, it's a thin section. R of it is a very, very large value. So you can see how much higher the shear stress in the open section is. Any question in relation to the comparing the strength of these two structures? Now let's compare the stiffness of these two, how much they deform. So on the left-hand side, I just used the equation we had for a circular tube subject to a torque, TL over GJ. T is the torque applied length, G is the shear modulus, and a J is equal to 2 pi r cubed T, the same J I've written for you on the top. So I substitute the values. Now we move on to the right hand side. In books, usually they use J for this one. I just made, I wanted to make sure it's not, I'm not going to confuse you during the exam. I'm using J prime for it. 
So J, J primary repeat is not polar second moment of area, it's called a torsional constant. J prime is equal to, based on the equation I showed you, is 1 over 3 Bt cubed. And as one of your students said, B is equal to 2 pi r, which is the total perimeter of the cylinder. So I'm going to substitute the values. And B is equal to 2 pi r. Therefore, we've got this relation. Now, I'm going to find the ratio between these two. So it's even worse. It's, we've got r squared divided by t squared. So in terms of its stiffness, it's much worse even when you compare it with the strength. So as I said earlier, so open sections hardly have any strength and stiffness when it comes to torsion. I mean, that was the reason for a few years I didn't teach it to students. Anyway, any questions in regard to this part? Okay, and on the last, in the last example of this uh, section, we've got a channel section subject to a torque is applied about its shear center, an open section has a shear center which is always outside of the section, which I explain it uh, in next week. Uh, the only difference between this channel section and the one we analyzed earlier was that this one has variable thickness, that's the only difference. So this equation is still valid. The only difference is definition of J prime because the thickness is variable. So J prime, we have to find the value of J prime for each of these panels and add them up. And this is how we find it. This is included in your examination data sheets. So the thickness is variable. So I've written one over three B one T one cubed B1 is 1 and a half A, B2 T2 cubed, B2 is equal to 2A, and B3 T3 cubed, which is equal to A, B3 is equal to A. Now, if you substitute the values, and obviously the maximum shear stresses occur on the top and bottom layers of the thinnest rib, not y-axis. I haven't written y, I haven't added y-axis here. Y is the, at the top and bottom of the strip which is folded at different locations. So Y is attached to the cross section of the thinner strip, not the section. So we call XY coordinate system a local one. If we added an XY coordinate system, that becomes a global one. Uh, so Say it again. That is a very good question. You need to look at, because this is, as I said, open section is treated differently with the other two we analyze. In the first one, we remember when we had a circular cylinder subject to a torque, the maximum, when it was, they had a hole inside, the maximum shear stress occurred on the outer layer. This is very similar to that one. So the thickest one is subject to the maximum shear stress. So it should be the bottom. Yes, that's correct. So the, highest one, but if somebody asks you to find the maximum shear stress for each one, then you need to go for one by one to find, that, find it. So I repeat, for the cross section ones, either single cell or multi cell, when they were subject to a torque, the through thickness variation of shear stress was ignored. We only had one shear stress at each point and we had one shear flow at each point. The story for open sections is completely different. You can see the shear stress depends on y, y coordinates. So the maximum shear stresses, even if it is a thin, it occurs at the top and bottom layers of the, each panel. Any question or questions in regard to this example? In the last steps, it is J dash. Say it again, please. 
Yes, this is J prime, yes, yes, yes. So as I said, in majority of tech, they don't use J prime, they just use J, so it should have been J, yes. Any other questions? So this is what you have in your examination data sheets. So this is what we had in the previous years, there's no difference. So I've added this part as well. So we start with a torsion of solid circular shafts and tubes. So the angle of twist, the shear stress, which has a linear variation in terms of R. Then we move on to single cell tubes subject to a torque. So we have one relation between the torque applied and the shear flow. And the shear flow is the product of the thickness and the shear stress. The rate of twist, you can either write it in terms of a torque or in terms of the shear flow. For a single cell, you're allowed to move Q from integral and place it outside. So that's fine. You can either write it as in terms of Q or in terms of a torque. If I want to find the strain energy stored for a single cell, or even for multi-cell, I use this relation. The work done is equal to the torque applied, the angle of twist divided by two. And if I write it in terms of um, T is equal to 2AQ, then we write it in terms of the area enclosed by the perimeter, shear flow and angle of twist. Depends on what data you've been given and what sort of analysis you want to do. The equation here is very similar to what you had in chapter one. It gives you strain energy stored per unit volume. So where does this come from? It comes from a stress to strain curve. And if the shear stress, so for unit, I mean, you can write uh, the, obviously, you can write it in terms of the shear flow as well. But if you want uh, to find uh, the strain energy stored, overall energy stored, then you have to perform a volume integral of a distance over the volume. So you end up with this relation. I don't recommend you to use this equation. I think if you have the angle of twist, multiplied by T divided by two. So this is for single cell. This is single cell. Now we move on to multi-cell tubes. So we've got equilibrium. The torque, external torque, is equal to the summation of internal torques. So shear flows are different in each cell, so therefore we cannot just use this equation to analyze the problem. We also need compatibility equations. So as you can see, if you compare this equation with the top one, Q is placed inside the integral. In the top one, because it's constant, it's placed outside. So combining these two, you can solve a multi-cell tube subject to a torque. And this is the strain energy stored, again, similar to what we had here. It's very similar. These two are the same. This is applicable because Q is constant. Here is not constant. And this is what I just covered for you. A thin strip, you can use the equations for when the section is open. In that case, J changes, just J prime, which is called torsional constant. And if you've got variable thickness, then we use this relation. Right, is it 12 minutes to 11? Any questions? Okay, so we finished chapter four. We move on to chapter five in the second hour. Thank you.
excuse me, can you listen to what I'm saying, please? I received a couple of questions from the students. One of them is that some of the students say, one of the students said he didn't receive any digital receipt. I have got all the digital receipts on Blackboard. Whenever you receive something, I receive it as well. I check all of them on there. There's a possibility it's gone to your junk mail. So my advice to you is that when I open the submission portal for your first coursework, please could you just send a blank page? And if you don't receive a receipt because of that blank page, just send me an email. You won't lose any marks because you have unlimited attempts for submission. Does it make sense? So, as I said, it doesn't matter if you submit a blank page, it's not going to affect your mark or anything. As soon as your coursework is ready, submit it. So I've got, uh, at the moment, as soon as you submit a work, as soon as you submit a work on Blackboard, uh, a folder is created for the unit coordinator. You receive a re digital receipt. I, the unit coordinator, also receive a digital receipt. So the second question, one of the students had difficulties with understanding the area here. She is going to explain it again. Another question was that, uh, as I said, when you're designing a structure, you're designing it for the collapse load, the maximum load the structure can carry. So when, as I said, if it's a combination, you've got a structure which is a combination of open and closed section, just ignore the existence of the open section because it does not carry much load. Make your design a bit more conservative. So I don't say ignore it completely. You can do, do the calculations, but in comparison with the closed section, it hardly carries any load. Does this answer the question? Okay. And the other one, I believe one of the students said in one of the questions, I didn't give you the talk, but the talk was given on this slide. So if I have a look, if there are any mistakes in the description of the question, I will let you know and I upload uh, the description of the question with the right value for the talk. Are there any other questions? So the, the, you said you had difficulty understanding the area, which I'm going through it very quickly, not the whole um, slide because it's already available on podcast. So here we've got a tube with the thickness of dy, so t is equal to dy, and it's subject to a, a torque of dt. So the area is equal to 2b times y. The top panel is located at the distance of y from the x-axis. Do you agree the bottom panel is also located at the distance of y? So this height is equal to 2y. The width is equal to b. So area enclosed by the perimeter is equal to 2b times y. Are you happy with this, this explanation? Okay. Now in the equation here, when I remove the g and t from the integral, you end up with a loop integral of ds. It means you start at a point on the section, go around, and end up at the same position. Now say we don't make any approximations, then in that case, ds starting from this point and ending up at the same point is equal to b plus b plus this distance. Are you happy with that? Do you agree this is even less than t? So we, when we are calculating ds, we just write it as 2b. We ignore the 2y in the equation. So that is the definition for area, and that is definition for ds. So ds, you start at one point and end up at the same location. Therefore, ds is equal to 2b plus 2y. But we ignore that 2y. Does it answer the question? Did I answer all the questions? Have I left out anything? Okay. So we move on to chapter. Again, I said you, in uh, the book by Rees, uh, Solids and Structures by Rees, 
It, the, it finds these equations for you using equilibrium, includes a warping displacement, and finds this equation. In Mexon, it uses membrane analogy or membrane theory to find it. In another book, I believe I looked at it, it uses equilibrium. I mean, there are different methods of doing it. Now, do you have a question raising your hand? Question 15, of course I can. Is this, is this four, 13, 14, and 16, and 15? So I believe one of the students said this should be A, not 2A. Is that correct? Okay, this is the same question I believe one of the students asked me. As I said, if there are mistakes in the description of the example, I'll let you know. So I, prepare, I added these uh, three examples the day before I was preparing your laboratory assessment sheets. So if there are, so I did it in half an hour. So there are obviously a couple of mistakes. There. So if there are any mistakes, I will let you know. Is that okay? Fair enough. But technically, there are no mistakes. If there are mistakes, it's a typing error. Okay. Thank you. So we move on to. Uh, Next a chapter, and that is a chapter five, theories of bending. So in the previous section, all the structures we analyzed were subject to torsion. So torsion is also a moment, but it's called torsional moment because the moment is tangent or parallel to the cross-section. For bending, the moment is obviously normal to the cross-section. Now, good news is when we are analyzing a thin walled and a thick walled section subject to torsion, in terms of stress, normal stress, and in terms of deflection, we treat them exactly the same, except in calculation of the second moment of area. The only difference between the two is when we are analyzing them subject to shear loading. Solid sections, the shear stress or flexural shear stress because of bending is very, very small. <coughs> so usually they are ignored. So the only difference is a shear loading of thin wall sections, and that is the last part of this chapter, which I believe is the hardest part of the course. When you need to find the position of the shear center and shear flow distribution, this is the hardest part of the section. But the rest of them, exactly the same when we are analyzing a solid section or thin wall section in terms of normal stress and in terms of deflection. Now, in, in the analysis we do here at the moment, we assume the section has at least one axis of symmetry. So that's why we call it a symmetric bending. So the section has at least one axis of symmetry, and the plane of the bending moment is either the plane of symmetry of the section or principal plane of the section. For sections we have no axis of symmetry, then obviously they are called asymmetric bending, and you've got a large section in Mexon for analysis of asymmetric sections. Now, we call a beam a laterally loaded a structure member whose cross-sectional dimensions are small in comparison with their length. So they are not axially loaded. They could be axially loaded, but when it comes to theories of bending, we say laterally loaded members when their cross-sectional dimensions are small. So in that case, the wing of an aircraft can be considered as a beam. It's subject to a lift load, it's subject to drag, it's subject to thrust, it's subject to all the attachments and also the weight of the engines. The fuselage itself can be considered as a beam. It's also subject to lateral shear forces. The other example is a chassis of a car. Again, it's a laterally loaded a structural member. The weight of the body and the passengers apply lateral load to the chassis of the car. Or another example is an overhead transmission pole. 
the wind loads are considered as horizontal forces which are laterally applied to a, an overhead transmission port. Or the body of a ship. The buoyancy forces are laterally loaded, or the weight of the ship itself are laterally loaded forces applied to it. But when it comes to theories of bending, the beam in theories of bending has a uniform cross-sectional area along its length. So if you look at the wing of an aircraft, it's a tapered beam. But theories of bending does not deal with tapers, tapered beam. It is concerned with the beams which have uniform cross-sectional areas along their length. So if you're analyzing a tapered beam, then you need to find its effective area for your analysis. And still, you can use theories of bending. So when we are analyzing and Sorry. When we are analyzing a structure, which is a beam which is subject to bending, we are after its failure load, how much load it can carry before it completely collapses. Or based on the criteria you're going to learn in chapter six, what's the maximum stress, the maximum force we can apply for the stress remains lower than a limb, safe stress of the material. So we are after the safe, the maximum stress a, be a beam it can carry, and also the maximum deflection it could have. So when you're designing a wing, you could keep the stress very low, but at the same time, you don't want the wing to flop. So you have to have a combination in your design to look at the criteria for the maximum de deflection and also the maximum stress in a beam. So as I said, we said we are, in this chapter we focus on symmetric bending. So the section has at least one axis of symmetry and the plane of the bending moment is on the plane of symmetry or the principal plane of the section. So the structure at the moment is subject to pure bending. It means I, have, I can simulate it using a couple similar to what you did in the lab for the talk. So the forces, two forces which are equal in opposite directions are applied to the beam. So this is what we call pure bending moment. And this is the deformed geometry of the beam. The beam can also be bent by a lateral shear force, similar to what you see at the moment. In terms of deformation, they are very similar, but obviously in terms of analysis, they are different. A beam can also be bent by a lateral distributed load. Again, the deformation is similar, but in terms of analysis, is different. So in all the analysis I do for you in this chapter, we have attached the XY coordinate system to the cross-section, and the origin of the z-axis is at the left end of the um, beam. If you've done it differently in previous year one, I believe you did a bit of analysis last year, do whatever you're comfortable with. But this is how I am going to do it. So x, y attached to the cross-section, and the origin of the z-axis is at the left end. Now these are the assumptions we have. So the beam has at least one axis of symmetry, and I think I explained that already. I said that one as well. I said this one as well. So these are the notations we use in this chapter. So the distributed load, we use a, low, a small or lowercase w, and I write it in terms of z, because as you can see, we could have a uniform distributed load, we could have a linear distributed load. So I've written it in front of w, bracket z, it means it's a function of z. We use capital V to show the shear force. And I, again, in front of it, I've written z because shear force you drew some shear force diagrams last year. So shear force has, is a function of Z as well. And we use capital M, similar to what you did in the past, for bending moment. And again, that is a function of Z. We have deflection, little v. And we've got a slope using a theta. So all of them are functions of Z. Any question on slide number two?
Okay. Now, I kept, in the previous lecture, I kept saying a, a structure is determinate or indeterminate. So here I am defining, I've given you some definitions of a slide number three. Determinate structures and indeterminate structures, in sometimes indeterminate structures, also called a redundant structures. For determinate structures, the number of equilibrium equations and number of unknowns are the same. So we have three equilibrium equations for 2D analysis. We could have, afford to have up to three unknowns. So for this beam at the moment, we have up to three unknowns at the support. So therefore, the problem is considered as determinate. For an indeterminate problem, the number of equilibrium equations is less than number of unknowns. So you can see in this one, the structure is redundant. We cannot just solve it using equilibrium. We need energy methods, compatibility equations to analyze it. So you can write next to it, this is also called a redundant structure. And an aircraft structure is fully redundant. An aerospace structure is fully redundant. Because of safety, you have too much constraint or restraint in the structure. You cannot just solve it using equilibrium equations. You just either analyze it numerically, experimentally, or some other forms of analysis you included to design your structure. Now, beams are usually classified in terms of the supports. This is called the simply supported beam because, as you can see, there is an, the beam is allowed to rotate at the supports. So there is no beam, the moment applied at the supports. This is a built-in support. You can see at one corner, the beam is not allowed to rotate. So therefore, the angle of, I mean, the slope at this location is equal to zero. And on, on this beam, I've shown you all the different types of loading we are going to deal with in this chapter. You've got a uniform distributed load, we have linear distributed load, concentrated shear force, and a pure bending moment. So this is called pure bending moment. These also bend the structures, but in a different, I mean, calculations are different. This is the most important part of it. We call a bending moment negative not when the direction of the bending moment is clockwise or anticlockwise. We call a bending moment a positive when the top layer is concave and the bottom layer is convex. We call it a negative bending moment when the top layer is convex and the bottom layer is concave. So please, could you draw a line around this part? And I repeat. The sign of the bending moment is not based on being clockwise or anticlockwise. It's based on the way the shape of the beam is after the moment is applied to. Any question on slide number three? Yes, please. Can you go to the sign dimensions of the bending? Of course I can. So when I'm Applying at the moment, you can see one of these bending moments is clockwise and one of them is anticlockwise. So we don't say it is positive or negative based on that. We say it based on the shape of the way the shape of the beam is. As you can see, the top part, this bending moment, is considered negative because the top part of it is convex and the bottom one is concave. Now look at this one. This one at the moment. The top one is concave and bottom one is convex. Now based on this, could you tell me if I draw the shape of this for you, say this beam at the moment, based on the forces applied to it, this is an exaggerated deformed geometry of the beam. Do you agree with me? So can you tell me at each point, is the bending moment positive or negative? Positive. Excellent, positive. So based on the shape of the, I've done any, no, I have done no calculations. 
because all these loads are applied downwards, so the convex is at the bottom and the concave is at the top of the beam. So for this one, could, can somebody tell me, or can you tell me please, is this positive or negative, this one? Negative. Excellent, this is negative. So this is negative, you can see the shape is convex at the top and concave at the bottom. But this one is convex at the bottom and concave at the top. Does it answer the question? Yeah? Any other questions on the slide number three? Okay. So we move on to a slide number four. This is something you, you I believe you've, you did a lot last year. You did some shear force and bending moment diagrams. So briefly go through them. The bit which is important to me are general equations for writing shear force and bending moment distribution and slope and deflection that you're going to use it for your part of your coursework as well. So say this is a simply supported beam subject to a lateral distributed load which is nonlinear. You're looking at a tiny element from this beam with the length of delta z, a differential of z. So z is along the axis and xy is attached to the cross section. So I'm looking at this tiny element here. And this is the load applied. So I know I have drawn this downwards. Say the sign of wz is hidden in this figure. So I assume the sign is hidden. Now I'm If I look at this element, the force either the distributed that is applied downwards or upward, it's not the point. So say the shear force here is in the opposite direction of whatever I have applied to. So this is the shear force because it has a nonlinear value, I mean uh, non-uniform variation. The shear force at the other side must be either smaller or bigger than this one. So I have said on the right hand side is downwards plus delta V. Now, you agree that at the moment, this force, this force, and the force at the top create a moment which is a point, say point O. It means if there's a bending moment here, we have a bending moment which is either slightly bigger or smaller. So if a bending moment applied on the left hand side is M, on the right hand side, might be smaller or bigger. Now this tiny element is in equilibrium, the same as the whole beam is in equilibrium. So the first thing we do for this beam to stay in equilibrium is that summation of the forces in Y must be equal to zero. So summation of the forces in Y equal to zero, we've got one force here, one force here, and the force because of this distributed load. So if we ignore that this distributed load is linear, we assume for this small area, it's almost uniform. So I say V minus V plus delta V plus W delta Z. So at the moment, the sign is hidden inside W. So this V is going to be eliminated. And then I can say W is equal to delta V over delta Z. Now say delta Z originally was one centimeter or two centimeters. Now if delta Z is very, very small, it means delta Z approaches zero, I can write these differentials as a finite, these finite differences as a differential equation. I can say if delta Z is very small or approaches zero, then W is equal to the derivative of dV over dZ. But what does this equation tell us? This equation tells us if I have an equation showing the shear force distribution, we know that the derivative of a function at, with respect to a variable is the slope of the function in that position. So this equation tells us that the slope of the shear force distribution at any point is equal to the intensity of the distributed in that location you know that if I've got a function, the derivative of a function always is a slope. That is what the definition of a slope is. So it tells us the slope of the shear force distribution at any point 
is equal to the intensity of the distributed load in that location. Now I'm going to integrate this equation. So I rearrange it. I write it as dv equal to wdz and integrate it between two points along the length of the beam. Say between these two points. In that case, I can say the derivative of, I, I write it as integral. I can say that the change in shear forces between two points is equal to the integral of W dz. What is the integral? It's the area under the curve showing the distributed load. So the change in shear forces between two points is equal to the area under the curve showing the distributed load. And using these two equations, you obviously drew shear force diagrams last year for a beam subject to different types of loadings. So you found this equation based on the equilibrium of shear, I mean, based on equilibrium of the forces in the y direction. Now say we are going to go for the bending moments because this is a sitting equilibrium. We have no forces applied in the x direction. So that is satisfied. Summation of the forces in x equal to zero. Now summation of the moments with respect to any point on this section is equal to zero. So therefore we've got a moment here. If I'm writing with respect to O, this force is passing through O, does not produce any moment. We have this one, we have that one, we have this one, and we've got the moment created by this distributed load. So I've written it as M. So it doesn't matter if it is positive or negative. So I've said these two are in the opposite direction. So M minus M plus delta M. We've got a shear force of V, which is the same moment as that direction. So this is positive. And this distributed load, say it is not non-linear, it's uniform for a very small region, is equal to Wz, and then it's acting at its center, which is delta Z over 2. So you end up with this term. Now here we've got a very, very small value, because delta Z is very, very small, and it is squared. So I can ignore this term. So you end up with this relation now. You say the derivative of the bending moment with respect to z is equal to the shear force. What does this tell us? It tells us the slope of the bending moment diagram at any point is equal to the shear force in that location, similar to the top one. Or I can say the changing bending moments between two points is equal to area under the integral or area under the curve showing the shear force distribution. Now using these two equations, you can easily draw the shear force and bending moment diagrams for a beam subject to any type of loadings applied to it. So any question on slide number four? It's not new to you, I believe. Any questions? Okay. So I'm going to go through the shear force and bending moment diagrams quickly. But I, as I said, no question in exam for shear force and bending moment diagrams of beam subject to bending. You will have definitely shear flow diagrams, which I'm going to cover it next week. However, I need to briefly go through the shear force and bending moment diagrams. But please write down the important parts are writing general equations. That is examinable. So we start with the, this cantilever beam, which is subject to a force of F. I have removed the support. I have added the reaction force, which is equal to F, and the reaction moment, which is equal to FL. Is this a positive bending moment or is it a negative bending moment? <coughs> Sorry. Yes, absolutely. It's negative. So if I draw the deformed geometry, you can see this is 
convex at the top, concave at the bottom. So this bending moment is a negative bending moment. It is anti-clockwise, but it is a negative bending moment based on the sign convention. Now, what is the shear force applied at the support is equal to F. Now, the change in shear forces between two points is equal to, <coughs> sorry, is equal to the area under the curve showing the distributed load. The distributed load is equal to zero. Therefore, these two shear forces at two ends must be the same because we have no distributed load. The area under the curve is zero, so the shear force at this point must be the same as the other side. So this is a shear force distribution. Now we move on to the bending moment distribution. The bending moment at the support, based on the sign convention, is a negative value. The change in bending moments between these two points is equal to this area. We've got minus FL here, we've got FL here, therefore the bending moment at this position must be equal to zero. So the top one is the shear force distribution, the bottom one is the bending moment distribution. Now I'm going to write for you the general equations for it, which is you need it for your, the last part of your assignment sheets. Distributed load, we have no distributed load. It's equal to zero. The integral of distributed load is the shear force. And the integral of shear force is the bending moment. What is the integral of F in terms of Z? Yes, please? M. The moment. Yeah, I appreciate that. MZ, yeah, absolutely. But the integral of S is FZ. Oh, M is FZ. Okay. And at, at the support, the value of the bending moment is minus FL, so I add it. So the three equations, they are called general equations for the distributed load, shear force, and the bending moment. Any questions on this? This is the easiest one. So we move on to the left-hand one. The left-hand one is also a cantilever beam, subject to a lateral uniformly distributed load. So we've got, at the support, we've got a force of WL. Are you happy with WL? Now the change in shear forces between these two points is equal to this area. This is W multiply L is downwards minus WL. So it means the shear force at this location must be equal to zero. This is uniform, so it must have a linear distribution. Now we move on to the bending moment distribution. The bending moment is positive or negative? Is this bending moment in terms of, is it positive or negative? Negative, well done. Now, the change in bending moments between two points is equal to this area. This has a linear variation, and this is the integral of a linear function. This must be quadratic. The value here is a zero, so the slope at this point must be zero. So therefore, this has a, we have a parabolic equation, which is tangent at this location. So this is the bending moment distribution. Now writing the general equations. The distributed load is constant. So we just say at the moment it's downwards, minus W. The integral of shear force is minus WZ. But we have a constant value at the beginning, so we have to add plus W at zero. At when you integrate a function, a final function, you have to add a constant value. So at Z equal to zero, the shear force is W L. Now the integral of shear force is a bending moment. So we have minus W over two Z squared plus W L Z, and what shall I add as the constant bending moment to the equation? This value here. 
So first I integrate it. At z equal to zero, the value of the bending moment is minus w z squared over two. Any questions on slide number five? So the bits which are examinable are at the bottom, the general equations. Just wanted to remind you the shear force and bending moment diagrams. Any questions on the slide number five? Okay, we move on to a slide number six. So in, on the slide number five, we had two cantilever beams. On the slide number six, we've got two simply supported beams. On the right hand side, the, the, the force is uniformly distributed. On the left hand side, we have a concentrated force. So I have removed the supports and then I have added the reaction forces at the two supports. Now we start with the shear force distribution. At this point, the shear force is WL over two. Now the change in shear force between these two points is equal to this area, which is minus WL. So the difference between these two is equal to minus WL, which is this area. So I've got this, I substitute in this value here in this equation, therefore the shear for CM must be minus WL over two. So we've got, this is the shear force distribution. Now we have a linear distribution. The integral of a linear distribution is a quadratic distribution. This is a simply supported beam. We have no bendings at two corners, at two ends. So at these two points, the bending moments definitely are zero. <coughs> now here we've got zero slope, so it has to be, have a zero, the curve is a parabolic curve, but it has to have zero slope here. This is plus, so this is ascending. And this is negative, so it must be descending. So this is the distribution of the bending moment. Now we write the general equations, which is examinable. The distributed load is constant, minus W, I integrate it. I add the constant value, which is here, this value here. And then the next integration gives me the bending moment distribution. I don't need to add any constant value because at this point the bending moment is zero. Any question in relation to this slide? Good, very good. So we move on to, do you remember if you had a concentrated force, how do we uh, treat the general equations? Which, what sort of function do we add to the problem? Does anyone remember the step functions? Yes? You mean, those, you mean those heavy side functions that you use the that you use these sideways caps to do? Angle, yes, the angle brackets. Yes, absolutely correct. Yes, yeah. this is what I'm going to use. Yeah, absolutely correct. So we have the shear force diagram. We have the bending moment diagram. So writing the general equations, what is WZ equal to? We have no W, there's no distributed load. So the next integral gives us the shear force diagram. But here, the shear force F does not exist, exist until Z is equal to L over two. So we need to use a step function. And what is the characteristic of a step function? Whenever the value inside it is negative, the function disappears. Whenever the value inside the bracket is positive, these two angle brackets get converted to a pair of ordinary brackets, which I explain it on this next slide. And when you integrate it, you just uh, treat it, you don't touch any, anything, any values inside the angle brackets, you keep it intact. Some, some, in some books, instead of angle brackets, they use the square brackets. 
Any questions in relation to slide number six? Okay, so I quickly just remind you what ST function is. So look at this function. You can see this function has discontinuity at z equal to a. When z is less than a, the value of the function is zero. Whenever the, the z is greater than a, the value of the function is equal to one. I can write these two as using piecewise equations, using two equations. But if I want to use one equation to show both of them, then I use the step functions. So instead of using two equations, I just use one equation. So look at this equation at the moment. Whenever the value inside the brackets is, zero, is negative, the function disappears, so it becomes zero. And whenever the value inside the brackets is positive, then these two become a pair of ordinary brackets. So the z minus a to the power of z is equal to one. So we have here whatever you see here. So instead of showing it as two equations, I use one equation to show it. Now, when you're dealing with the step functions, you just treat it as it is. You do not touch values inside the angle brackets because it loses its characteristics. So you do not integrate these terms one by one because it's not a step function anymore. So when you're integrating it, you need to keep whatever the value inside it intact. So this is not correct. So this is not accurate if I just integrate them term by term. This is not a step function anymore. Can you see this sign here? Any question regarding to slide seven? Yes, I'm just refreshing your memory. So we move on to a slide eight. What is a distributed load here equal to? No. Distributed load? Zero. Zero. Very good. The shear force at z equal to zero is equal to R1. So we don't want to draw the shear force of bending moment diagrams. We're just looking at the beam, writing the equations, similar to the last part of your assessment sheets, assignment sheets for the laboratory. So do I need a step function for f or not? Yes. So I'm going to use a step function for f. So minus f multiplied by z minus a to the power of 0. I'm going to integrate it. So m is equal to r1z minus r times z minus a. What is the value of the bending moment at left support? What is the value of the bending moment at the left support? Do we have? This is simply supported beam. Zero, well done. So that's it. So we don't need any constant value to be added. We move on to the next example. So the distributed load, do we need a step function for the distributed load or not? It's because the distributed load does not exist until z is greater than a. So therefore, we need a, a step function for the distributed load. I'm integrating the distributed load to give me the shear force. What shall I add here? What is the value of the shear force as z equal to zero? Our node, absolutely correct. So we've got our node here. Now the bending moment is the integral of this equation. So I'm not touching any values inside the angle brackets. I just keep it intact, and then I integrate it. So shall I add something here or not? Yes. And is it positive or negative? Negative. negative. So the, based on the deformation, is a negative from a bending moment. So I've written it plus, but the sign is hidden inside it. And the last part, The distributed load is at this start. So here I can say the solution to this problem is when we have a distributed load applied at the top, 
minus when we have a distributed haploid at the bottom. So therefore, I can say W is equal to minus W plus W times Z minus A to the power of naught. Is everyone happy with what I have written here? Okay. So I'm going to integrate it. And then I add the constant value at this point here. And then the next integration gives us the bending moment diagram, or the bending moment distribution. Any question on this slide? So I just refresh your memory. So I solve this when, at the end when we have time, because as soon as I I just briefly talk about this slide, this slide 25. And then I get back to the example and solve it. And then we just, that's the end of the session. So say we've got this B. It's very similar to the last part of your assignment sheets, laboratory assignment sheets. Say we've got this B. And that is a slide number 25. Say I attach X, Y, Z coordinate system to the cross section. Say subject to a shear force and a distributed load in the Y, Z plane. And also subject to shear forces and when distributed loads in the X, Z plane. Do you agree that the shear force and the distributed loads applied in the Y, Z plane bend the structure about the X axis? Do you agree with me? So based, these are very similar to examples I showed you earlier. If I apply these loads, they bend the structure about the X axis. So I've retained as MX here. Now if I have these shear forces, and distributed loads in the XZ plane. What is the bending moment applied about? That's correct. So the bending moments are applied about the Y axis. So in order to write the equations for this structure, first we look at all the forces applied in the YZ plane and write the general equations for MX. Then we look at the same structure in the XZ plane and write the general equations for MY. And this is what you're supposed to do for that example. Yes, please. So I'm talking about this. All you just have to do is split, split the beam up into two separate beams, one each addressed by its own moment. No. Okay. Sorry, you can't do that. No. I'm using superposition rule, okay. so I am, because material has linear elastic behavior, so I am assuming that those forces, moments, are applied individually, and then when you're going to find normal stresses, you combine them. No, you cannot divide the beam to two bits. We're not dividing the beam to two planes, we're finding the, uh, we're finding the uh, things for, what, for whichever. Okay. So is there any, are there any questions in relation to this one? So as I said, if you want to write the general equations for the last question of your laboratory assignment sheets, this is what you should be doing. OK. So we've got uh, three minutes to 12. And if you want to go, you can go, or I can solve an example for you. If I start solving example, nobody leaves. Okay, nobody leaves. So I'm going to solve an example for you. I have a lot to cover. Could you quickly write the general equations for this example, please? Could you write down the general equations for this example, please? What shall we write for the distributed load? No. Okay, I 
I start with the reaction force. What is the reaction force in the support? Can somebody tell me? Yes, please. Excellent, 14 kilonewton, excellent. What is the reaction moment at the support? Yes, please. Uh, 38. 38. So 6 times 2 is 12. Multiply by 3 is 36 plus 2 is 38. Absolutely correct. Well done. So we've got the shear force of 14 kilonewton and then the moment of 38 kilonewton. Why have I written as negative? Because of the shape. Well done. Now, for the distributor load, do we need a step function or we don't need a step function? We need a step function. Where is the value inside the angle brackets for the step function? Z minus 1 or Z minus 2 for the distributor load? Z minus 2. You shouldn't answer all the questions. I didn't answer. Do I need to add anything else here? No. So what is the integral of this distributed load? It's the shear force. So the integral is minus 6 times z minus 2 to the power of 1. Do we need a, a step function for the shear force or not? The shear force. I'm going to integrate it. So this is sorted. Now we have a distributed load of, sorry, a concentrated force of 2 kilonewtons and a reaction force of R naught. For the, dis for the concentrated force of 2 kilonewton, do I need a step function or not? Yes. What shall I write here next to 2 kilonewton? Z minus? One. Z minus 1. And what shall I add to this? What is the value of shift? Yes, please. That's right, plus our node, absolutely correct, plus 14. Now the next integration gives us the bending moment. So the this is a linear function, becomes quadratic. It's a constant function, becomes linear. This is a constant function, becomes linear. What shall I add here? M node, absolutely. <coughs> And thank you very much. It's nine minutes to 12.